the supervised, the final supervised classifier we're going to look at is PLSDA. The, the DA is for discriminant analysis. The thing to, to realize about PLSDA, it's just PLS, okay? The extra DA just comes from the way that we, we create the Y space, but the, it's nothing more than a PLS model. So you can use all the normal tools from PLS in the same way. But what we do is we create a Y space with columns, as many columns as we have groups. So if we've got G groups here, we create G new columns. And we put a one in, in the first column corresponding to group one, it's twos, uh, ones in the second column for group two, and so on. So this, uh, it, it's just a special Y space, right? And what, what is special about that Y space? If you look at the, those columns. What's the correlation between the columns? They're independent of each other. Every column in the Y space is totally independent of the other. There's zero correlation between them. Okay? So what is PLS doing? What is PLS's objective function? There's three things, remember? The first is explain the X space. So that's your raw data uh, in, over there on your on your different groups. The second objective is explain the Y space. But the Y space is this very orthogonal independent space, right? It's almost, if you have to build a PCA model on this, you'll get one component per group. Because it's just going to have to put a component to this group and then another component orthogonal to that. Because this is an orthogonal matrix. Right? You, to build a PCA model for this, you're going to have to fit as many components as there are columns because of this orthogonality in there. So it's really a, 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 a model for that space is a purely independent uh, load, going to have loadings going in every direction. And then the third objective, of course, is to maximize the covariance between those two uh, scores from the T, from the X, and the U's from the Y. So the PLS model from this very special Y space is you're, one way to see it is you're taking what the unsupervised classifier from PCA, which is just building a model for the X space. Take that PCA model, and now you're kind of twisting the latent variables and moving them so that they also model the Y space and maximize the covariance. But because this Y space has such independent directions, you're really adjusting those latent variables to be have maximum discrimination, is one way to see it. So you're shifting your latent variables, you're encouraging the latent variables to go in directions so that not only they explain X, your, your data on your G groups, but also so that they separate those groups out for you, those clusters from the different classes. Okay? So it's, it's just PLS with a very special Y space to encourage the model to, to do that, to have that discrimination function. And when we use the model, we use it like an ordinary PLS model. We take our X data coming in, project it onto the W stars to calculate the scores, get the T squared value from the scores, get the X hat from uh, multiplying T by P, get the SPE value from the residuals, and also once we have the scores from up here, we can multiply it by the weights from the Y space to get Y hat. Now, We'll get a y hat vector for, for this new observation. That y hat vector contains as many entries as there are classes. Because of the way we've constructed the y space up here, we built this y matrix so it has as many columns as there's groups. So when we predict y hat for a new observation, we're going to predict a vector y hat with one entry per group. Now remember when we built the model, the y space was either zero or one. Okay, so the y, the actual y is either a zero or a one. But when we predict, we're not going to get an identical zero or an identical one. We'd love it if we could have got exactly a prediction of zero or one, but we're never going to get that. So let's take this example where we're taking an observation that really does belong to class three. So it's real y value in, when we build the model had 0, 0, 1, 0 in the vector for the y space. 
when we predict it, ideally we would like to get 0, 0, 1, 0, but we're not. We're going to get numbers something like minus 2.4 plus 0.9.1. And we can see that, that that prediction of the four predictions, it shows greater affinity towards class 3 than it does to the other classes. So in practice, I would say, yes, this observation belongs to class 3. But still, there's, there, you can see where there might be ambiguity there, right? What if I got two high-ish values here? Which class do I choose? I could pick the highest one. Uh, and it also, it's a little bit unsatisfying to some people, the fact that you don't get numbers that go between 0 and 1. Some people see this as a, as a probability. This is the probability that I'm getting a class 3 observation. But you really shouldn't see it that way. Because you can get predictions that are negative, and you can get predictions actually like, you can easily get a plus one point something. For example, these observations here are all greater than one. So you can't treat it as a probability prediction either. It's not the probability that it belongs to that class. Uh, loosely speaking, I guess, of these four variables, you can say, yes, it's more probable it belongs to its class, but you can't say the probability of membership in class three is 92%. That's not, that's not correct. And the other reason why you can't do that is because when we use a PLSDA model, we don't just take the predictions from, from y hat into account. We also take into account the location of that new observation in the score space. So it's an ordinary PLS model. When we bring in a new observation, we can calculate the score values. And we can hopefully see clustering, or we should see clustering in the score space for PLSDA. And we can take the location in the score space into account. So let's take a look at, uh, at the example, and I'll demonstrate some of these advantages from PLSDA. PLSDA, in my mind, it really is one of the nicest tools for classifiers. But whenever I build a classifying, classifier model for, for companies or uh, on data, my own data, the first step I do is always do a PCA, just to look at the clusters that are actually apparent and not. Then I do a Simca model in each of my classes, and then I go to a PLSDA at the end. Usually I stick with the PLSDA model as my best classifier. It usually does give me the best performance. But I, I go and learn from those first few models there. There's always some additional insights that I pick up along the way. So let's go look at the olive oil data. And I'll show you how to build a PLSDA model in the software. You go model new as, and you can just pick any of your previous models to start from, it doesn't matter. We're going to build a PLSDA model of all my variables and my observations. It may, just make sure that all your observations are included. Okay? So all, all of them are green, but notice that the column for class has dashes. Um, I need to tell the software to create class values, and it's going to construct that Y matrix for me automatically. So I don't need to create that Y matrix myself. The software takes care of that for you. Then you just go down and say, create class uh, from the region variable, and make sure you check that box. We'll change the text down here to emphasize that this is going to be a discriminant PLST model. Now, you can and you should do this. I highly recommend you do this. Offline, import this data file into Excel and create a Y space that looks like zeros and ones manually. Bring it into the software and set that Y space that you've created to be the Y space. And just tell the software to build an ordinary PLS model. Don't tell it to build a PLS yet. And if you compare those two models, you'll see they're identical. It's just a good proof to yourself that a PLSDA model, that you manually go and create the Y space and you don't tell the software that's a PLSDA model, but you're getting the identical results. Okay. So create PLSDA, say OK. And also put in that model, five, four components. T1, T2. What do you notice this time? You see a nice two. Nice-ish separating clusters. Uh, we can confirm that with the uh, coloring. Apply that. 
and we see very good separation this time. Uh, and certainly, not, maybe not excellent, but certainly a whole lot better than we did before. So very minimal misclassification here between white versus red, very minimal misclassification between red versus black, and black versus red. You could probably find, sometimes when you do get this misclassification like this red point up here, remember, the person who created this original data set could have made a mistake. So I've had that many times when I've imported data, built my initial model, and I find this classification. If I go back to the company and I ask them about those misclassified points, they say, oh, we, we, we said it wrong. And so actually the, the model will sometimes fix it up or show it, point that out to you. Okay? Especially if you've got, say, a red dot in the middle over here. Right? So that would, uh, that, that's very likely the company made a mistake in that case. The other thing to check is SPE. Um, so it's also nice, you'll see your SPE outliers are the ones that are often misclassified. If I highlight those, yeah, no, in this case, the SPs are not the misclassifications. They're, uh, they're all within the classes that they are. But these are points that are all the model space. And in this particular data set, there's not too many of them. So I wouldn't go through a round of excluding them. Uh, they're all pretty OK to my mind. Now the really powerful part is the following three plots. Loadings, coefficients, and VIPs. Let's take a look at all of them. I might go plot the loadings by plot. And I color code that. I'm getting a ton of information from this plot. I'm, I'm likely going to learn the same thing as I learned from my previous Simca models and my PCA models, the unsupervised PCA model and the supervised Simca model that I built earlier. But in this case, I'm really getting a bit stronger separation. It's showing me the loading W star here as these red dots. So unfortunately, the color coding is a little bit ambiguous, but that square over there with the N next to it is for the W is the C value for the Y space, for, for the N column, for the northern um, observations. This S square over here is the loading C from the Y space for south, and over here is I. So it's, notice also the strong separation between S, I, and N. We often see this, if you've got three classes, you see a triangular pattern. If you've got two classes, they'll be opposite. They can be anywhere opposite, but they're usually diagonally opposite. And if you've got four classes, it kind of forms a square because of that Y space that's so orthogonal. And PLS's objective is to also explain the Y, so it separates them out maximally. And the maximum way it can separate them out, the three classes, is a triangle. So S, I, and N. And Green over here, S for there, and N, these are my northern samples over here in red. The black samples are my W stars. Um, well, again, color, a bit confusing with the colors. These black circles here are the T score values for the southern states, but these ones with labels next to them are my W stars. So it's showing my southern olive oils have high values of palmitic acid, palmotoleic acid, and linoleic acid, and isocinoic acid. <laughs> so southern states have very high values of those four fatty acids. Conversely, the northern states and the islands have lower values of those fatty acids. They're on this side. So low, low values of those fatty acids for my green and my red cluster, and high values of those fatty acids for my black cluster. Look where stearic acid is. Right there in the center, it's got very little weighting, neither T1 nor T2, P1, uh, W star 1, W star 2. Uh, there are four, four components, so I really should go investigate the other two before I rule out that stearic acid is totally useless. But certainly from the perspective of separating the classes, which happens in, in T1, T2, stearic acid plays very little role. So based on this information, I would say if in the future my only objective is to separate classes, I wouldn't need stearic acid. Stearic acid may be useful for some other purpose, but for the purpose of separating clusters, it's not that helpful. Okay. Also, this green cluster over here would 
So we've, we've established that negative correlation here. There's a strong positive correlation between oleic acid and, and the red cluster. So high levels of oleic acid in my red class, slightly less high values of oleic acid for my green class, and then lower values of oleic acid for my uh, black class over here. Okay, so there's that natural progression because of the loading in this first component for oleic acid. And you would also find that this uh, linoleic acid would have some trend. Green class here would have higher values of linoleic acid followed by black, and within black there would be a steady progression down. There's probably a progression of the states in the northern, sorry, the southern region across here. So that progression would just follow for linoleic acid and uh, my island states over there, they don't have, they have low, lower values of linoleic acid as well. Now these are just generalizations, right? You should always, uh, if it's an important observation to you, you should always double check it in the raw data. But I'm making generalizations in my loading spot and my score plot. But it's still extremely, extremely powerful. Like I said, I've only looked at, at W star one versus W star two. I should go investigate the others. Um, but one tool I can use to understand the relationships of the variables among all the components, the correlation of the variables among all the components is the coefficient plot. Okay. So let's take a look at the coefficient plot. And because it's a coefficient plot, we have to pick which variable. Either it's the S grouping or the I grouping or the N grouping. We're going to build them. We're going to show the coefficients for. Uh, I'm not going to sort them. I'm just going to leave them in the order they originally are in the data set. Okay. And here, it summarizes the coefficients over all four components. That's the key point. It's, it's not just the T1, T2, W star W1 and 2. It's over all four components, showing me that isosomenoic acid is the strongest coefficient for discriminating S. Okay. Um, let's take a look at that back down here. Here's isosomenoic acid. It's got a very high weighting for X. All these classes, you can be very sure they have extremely high values for isosomenoic acid. We're seeing that confirmed in the coefficients a lot. So that generalization I made earlier, that palmitic and palmitoleic and linolinate acid are high for this class. Remember, it's a linear combination. They, it's likely they're high, but it might be that they're high just because of this variable. But it, it's likely that all four are correlated together and moved, moved together. But again, the coefficients plot, let's just see where those other three variables, linolinate and palmitoleic and palmic acid, do they have positive coefficients as well? Yeah, there's palm, there's two that means, uh, palmitoleic and palmitic. Okay, so both of them up here have positive coefficients with the sun states shown in the correct location. So my coefficient plot does gel with my loading plot in this particular example. Okay, and linolinic acid as well. If we look at the coefficients for the island, those are the important variables that distinguish island olive oils from, from the others. Again, this, this linolinic acid shows up high. This coefficient for isosinoic acid now is negative, right? Because the island states was the small cluster over there on the bottom left. So that this, it's this green cluster over here on my island states. They had low values of that isosinoic. So that makes perfect sense as well. And then the final class is for N. Um, again, very low values of this fatty acid and the linoleic acid. So coefficient plots are a good way to summarize all four of your loadings. And for PLSDA, it's got very strong interpretation as the variables that are important for separating that group out from the others. Then finally, you can go look at your BIP plot, which would give you the information that we've kind of got a hint of already. That these fatty acids are now ranked in terms of their importance. This isosinoic acid has shown up consistently in all the loading spots, all the coefficient spots, as a strong discriminator. So it is very important, the least important than the stearic acid. So that, that also agrees. But I, I really strongly suggest to look at loadings, coefficients, and the actual plot of PLSDA. There's, there's a lot of insight about why the class is separate and what's three plots.
Um, yeah, just some notes here. I guess uh, you get good moral interpretations if you just saw. Anecdotally, journal publications and people will say with uh, five or more cars of PLSD struggles to get good separation. Again, it makes, a bit, it makes some sense because your PLSDA model here is trying to explain all five Y classes with a single model simultaneously. So there's, you're really asking a lot of it. You're trying to discriminate between all five categories with a single model. And it's not always possible that a single model can scan enough of the space to do that accurately. So what people often resort to then is to say, well, if I've got five classes, A, B, C, D, e, and E, rather than building a single model, for A, B, C, D, e, and E. I'm going to build binary models. I'm going to build a model for A versus B, A versus C, A versus D, and A versus E. And then I'm going to build binary models B, C, B, D, B, A, and E. So they build like a whole hierarchy of, or basically a matrix of models. Because it's much easier to build a model, so you wouldn't need to repeat this A, B, but we already got there. So let's take a look at the A versus B case. You only try to build a PLSDA model between one class and the other. It's going to be much easier to do that, to discriminate between two classes, rather than trying to build a model that discriminates between all five in one go. So you're going to likely have much better separation on a model that's only built a PLSDA model whose only intention is to tell the difference between A versus B. So I've got a little bit of that here on the next slide. You've got three cases, three classes rather, A, B, and C. You can build one PLSDA model for all three classes. Or you can build a model A versus B and plus C, B versus A plus C, and C versus A plus B. Or you can go build G times G minus one divided by two combinations. So in the case where G is small, that's still manageable. But in the case where G gets even to four or five, that can quickly become a big number. But these are really strong discriminators. The A versus B, B versus C, C versus A, they're very sensitive and very powerful discriminators just for that two groupings. But then you have to go use a voting scheme to decide, right? So if you bring in a new observation, you apply it to this model. Is it A versus B? So it's going to tell you it's an A. Then you apply it to this model, and it's going to show up as a high SPE, so it's neither B nor C. Then you're going to apply it to this model, and it's going to tell you it's an A. So you've got two votes for A, so therefore it must be an A. So, but again, as you can see, this is a very simple three classes. If you've got four, five, six classes. This quickly gets quite, quite messy. Um, but again, if you automated it with the software, um, I've seen people try to do it, and it takes a long time to write the software to do this, but you get very powerful discrimination if you go that route. Uh, you can read this slide on your own, there's enough text here. <laughs> it's just some, some ways I've seen PLSDA models used in interesting, um, interesting situations. Okay, and then let's just wrap up here. Before we get to the case studies, I want to talk about this topic of validating and classifiers. For those of you that are doing competitions on the Kaggle website, for example, this is an important part of your, um, should be an important part of your model. If you look at these classification systems, like a PLSDA model, there's multiple things you have to decide. You have to decide how many components should I be using in my model. Where do I set my boundaries in the score space? Where do I draw those lines? Where do I decide for Y hat to make a prediction that it belongs either to one class or the other? If I go back, I didn't mention it too much over here, but if I look back at my observed versus predicted, I will almost always see some overlap there. So I have to choose where to put that, that separator to tell me that when I predict a y hat greater than, let's say, 0.6, I'm going to flip it to class 1. And if the prediction for it is less than 0.6, I'm going to set it to class 0. So I have to make a decision on where to place that line. So I've got, a, I've got those decision boundaries. And then also I have to decide if I'm going to use 99 or 95% of it. It's all of these things are things I have to decide for myself on setting up my classifier. And you can see with this freedom, I've got enough rope here to hang myself. I can easily overfit by choosing parameters that will work well for 
the training data set, but will not necessarily work well for the testing data set. So this is my recommendation. This isn't something that I, I've seen too much written about. Most people say use two data sets, one for testing, after you build the model. I would say, let's, let's stick to three data sets as follows. Build your model on one third of the data set, and you use that data set for cross-validation to choose A. Use your testing data set to find optimal choices for the boundaries. So you build your model, you find the loadings and the directions from your model build data set. Now you bring these observations from the testing set as new data. So the model wasn't built with these observations in mind. These new observations should fit into the same boundaries in the score space, but I don't want to go use my model building data set to, to go calculate my components and do my decision making for my boundaries. I'd rather build my model on one data set and use it for cross-validation. That's a major decision of itself. So I just want to use one, one third of my data for that. Use the other third of my data to decide where to place those boundaries. But these data that I use to do that come from testing data. They're not the same data I use to build my model. Then I, once I've decided where I'm going to put my boundaries, I'm going to test with the last third of the data. So when I make that decision with my boundaries, I obviously want to make that decision so I maximize my degree of discrimination. How do you quantify the degree of discrimination? If you go look at the software package, uh, we didn't look at it here, but it's not this software package alone. Uh, all, the, all of them do this. Unfortunately, they show a metric that's not that useful. So observed versus predicted. There's the observed versus predicted plot for category S. Okay. So, here I would place my, my separator somewhere over here, 0.4. That would be a good separating line to separate S as one versus non-S. So all my observations that are not in my S class get mapped to zero. If their predicted Y is less than 0.4, if my predicted Y is above 0.4, I'll say that observation comes from the S class. Okay. But unfortunately the metric they provide to measure that discrimination is root mean squared error of estimation. And root mean squared error of estimation is calculated on these data. Remember it says take your y minus y hat. That's your error. Root mean squared error of estimation says take error squared and then calculate the mean of that and square root it. But y is either 0 or 1. So if I predict a y hat of 0.5, I'm still saying that belongs to class 1, right? Because it's above my threshold of 0.4. So y hat of 0.5, I'm going to map that into class 1. But this calculation here is going to say 1 minus 0.5 and store that as my error, and then go ahead and calculate root mean squared error of this condition. But really, it's not an error at all because I've classified it into the correct category. I've classified it as class one. So really my error for that point should be zero. Okay, but it's going to, it's the, the problem where this comes is the software doesn't know we're doing classification yet. So it's just going ahead and using RMACE as if this was a continuous Y variable. The problem is it's not a continuous Y. So, Root mean squared error of estimation, R squared, Q squared, RMSEP, all these classical metrics that the software gives to you, they're useless for classification. They're not, they're not good metrics to decide that my model is improved. Let's say I decide I'm going to make a transformation of a particular X variable, and I recalculate my RMSEE, and I see it's gone up or it's gone down. In the context of classification, that's not too helpful. You cannot really compare those two. What is more helpful is to come up with some other way to quantify this classification. And that's where, uh, for those of you looking into these binary classifiers, I've asked you in, in your course project to look at the receiver operating curve and the area under the curve. Okay. So those two metrics are, are much better ways of judging 
the, the model. AUC itself has some shortcomings. So if you, if you read a bit more about it, there's another, another metric called the Matthews correlation coefficient, which is supposedly one of the best. I have not had a chance to look into it um, before this class. So I'll ask any of these students doing this as a course project to please look into that. Nor do I have time in the class today to discuss the receive operating characteristic at AUC. I will do it though in the next class. I've told a few people here that I'll do it, but I think we're, we're, we don't have enough time to do it in today's class. Everyone looks pretty tired. Um, so I don't want, this is, to, to get to the bottom of this, it will take at least 45 minutes or so to, to explain for us. So I don't want to cover it now, but for those of you doing the binary uh, classifications for categories or columns of course project, please read at the minimum the Wikipedia article for ROC and AUC. It's, it, it does explain it fairly well. Um, okay, so I'll leave this um, other case study here. Yeah, there's probably enough slides to understand what's going on. It's, it's a very, very interesting case study on using a, a vibration sensor to detect whether you've got osteoarthritis. If you take your knee and swing it a couple of times, hold your hand on your knee and swing it. Push, push hard with your fingers on your, knee, on your kneecap, like on the bone. Works better if you don't have clothing in between the right. You feel like little cracks and pops and vibrations sometimes. Uh, especially as you get older, that gets worse and worse, right? <laughs> it was very interesting because I did this, I, I helped Francois out collecting his data, so I was in the hospital, and some of the older patients, I'm holding the equipment onto their knee, and I can feel this thing vibrating because basically their knees, okay, this is a, a bad photo, so stop eating. This is a bone from a cow, and that, that should be smooth, right? That beautifully smooth surface is what it should be. But it's got these bony growths and deterioration, and that's what's causing that sound as it's moving like that. So uh, Francois used a sensor on the kneecap and his PLSDA model, here you can see the data coming from the sensors. So it's got vibrations and noise. And he uses that to uh, do a PLSDA model to tell whether you're healthy or whether you've got this problem of the tear in your cartilage or if you've got osteoarthritis. And uh, he used support vector, he used a PCA followed by support vector machines to do this. What was really interesting is uh, once he got these two classifications uh, to treat osteoarthritis, what they can do is they can inject uh, fluid into your knee as a lubricant. So this pa patient over here, she has osteoarthritis, but after the injection, she shows up back in the healthy region again with the normal patients. And the, re the reason why this is really helpful is because to diagnose osteoarthritis is very expensive. It's an MRI and an X-ray. And you can't just get those, from, like you can't just walk into the hospital and get them. And also, it takes about an hour once you're in the MRI to do this. Um, I was part of the study. I was actually one of the dots at that point. I don't know which because I, it's anonymized. But um, you sit in the MRI for an hour and try keeping still for an hour is the hardest thing to do for me at least. So it's 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 painful and slow to get this data point. But if you can get the same prediction with uh, a very cheap sensor, and I was trying to find Siama, he's got them up by his desk. So next time any of you see him upstairs, I'll ask him to show you. It's a tiny little thing, it's just this big, it just sits here. You just put it on your knee, swing your knee 10 times, and you get a prediction. So um, it's, a, it's an interesting case study, worth reading about the consequences. But the one I want to talk about here is uh, combines image data with, um, with classification. So. Let's take a look. Is this uh, Emily? Yes, Emily's. So Emily, um, Emily Nichols, and if you, uh, you're working with the father, um, his uh, finished up her thesis here in 2011. She uh, originally worked at Quaker Oats in Peterborough prior to her master's. So she's, the whole thesis is actually related to uh, case studies with them, with Quaker. And they gave her various samples. Of, of oats. So oats in, in Canada are harvested with their holes attacked. Uh, 
Um, and we don't remove those holes uh, in the field. They're in fact left intact and, and they use them intact for animal feed and so on. But for uh, food for human consumption, it's unpleasant to get one of those holes in your, in your teeth. They're like, it's like a popcorn shell, the same consistency. It's a hard, fibrous shell. It's not pleasant to eat. It's not going to kill you or anything, but it's just not, not helpful or nice to eat. And also, it's very difficult to detect it visually. Okay, so here I've got an illustration. Then on the right hand side is the oat. This is the, the seed with the shell on. The groat is the part on the inside. So basically, the groat is an oat without the shell. So take the shell off, and the oat becomes a groat. <laughs> now, visually, it's very, very tough to see that difference between the shell. It is there, but it's the same similar spectral color. So from an RGB perspective, red, green, blue perspective, it's very, very tough to discriminate between oats versus groats. And the reason why we want to do that is because the first steps in the flow sheet for processing this is to take your oats. There's a cleaning step to remove blocks and insects and other things. And then those go into a hull. The hull throws the oat at high speed onto an edge, and the hull pops off, leaving the growth behind. Okay, so what we get coming out of the hull is a mixture of separated hulls, oats with their hulls still intact, there should be few of those, though, because we hopefully pop them all off. But, and then the growths, the, un, the, the, the seed on the inside. The holes being light can go through an aspirator, and they'll get thrown off by air. Um, and then we should get mostly growths coming down here with, with some oats. Okay, so what grade A oats are, or grade A growths are considered to have very little oats. Emily can tell you the exact number, but it's a very minuscule, like just one or two oats in a sample will change it from grade A to grade B. It's very undesirable to have oats left over in the growth. You can try to maximize your separation by severe hulling, so you throw it with extreme, use extreme force on that, but then you'll break your growth down into smaller pieces, which there's a separation step on it that's based on size, and so you'll lose a lot of your raw material, your product, because you've broken it down to smaller parts. It's ideal to have larger growths, because then those get uh, flattened out and they form the oatmeal that you purchase in the store, those big, white, fluffy pieces of what you call oats, but they're really just flattened growths. Okay, if you conservatively hold, you'll leave a lot of holes intact, and again, if you, if you degrade from grade A to grade B. Okay, so yeah, that's that said, seeing here what um, Emily shows in her thesis, they used a commercial separator for wheat. They tried to make it work for oats from growth, but the misclassification at 0.6% is still too high to use. So even at 0.6%, misclassification is pretty tight. Also, a uh, great commission of Canada has been using NIR for wheat for many, many years. So Emily's, well, let's try looking at oats. The reason why oats hasn't received any attention is because it's only about 5% of the total crop produced in Canada um, is, is oats. So most of the crops we produce here are wheat. So it doesn't get much attention at all. This camera is here in the basement of this building. I, I used this illustration last week for you. What we're acquiring is the image, there's the sample, go through the spectrophotometer, which will filter out the, the wavelengths the near infrared wavelengths on the CCD, and then capture the x-axis as the second dimension of the CCD. So we're capturing a two-dimensional image on, on this camera, but remember, image data is a three-dimensional cube, so that third dimension is acquired by moving the sample over time. And acquiring successive lines, so here's our x-axis on the image, we're acquiring one line, but we're getting 128 wavelengths, or 100 and some, Emily's uh, system acquired 110 wavelengths, sorry. So we're acquiring 110 wavelengths at each pixel location, and then we're moving that over time to calculate the third dimension, building up a three-dimensional cube. So each, uh, we, the particular camera we have is very, very uh, old by today's standards. It's at least 10 years old. So it only acquires 125 pixels wide. We acquire about 110 wavelengths. Uh, 
think the camera does come with 128, but a few of them have broken over the years. Like a few of the pixels on the CCD are now dead and don't work. So we're down to 110. And then you can capture as many lines in the Y axis as you want by just running the thing for a long duration. So at each pixel location in the XY plane, we get this vector of 110 near infrared. Point. So it's kind of like having a near infrared probe and moving it from pixel to pixel. You acquire the whole near infrared spectrum at each pixel location. So my, my approximations, I don't know the exact sizes of the image, but given from these dimensions that Emily gives us the pieces, I've calculated that each image is about 26 megabytes. Um, and she, she used many, many of them over the pieces. If we unfold that image, we're going to get 125 rows by 500 columns because she's acquired 500 lines in my y axis, 125 rows in my x axis, so 62,000 rows by 110 columns. So that's what uh, the PCA is. And she used the MacMedia software that we used in the class last week. She put that matrix into the software and then did her work, uh, some of her work using that. There is another step that I'm not going to discuss, and that's to calibrate the camera first. So uh, Emily used the work of the previous students, uh, Zheng Lu. He showed how to calibrate the camera to correct for bad pixels and bad lighting. You can see her thesis and his thesis for that. Um, what I'm showing from now on are the calibrated uh, pixels. So we fixed up the problems with the camera, and we've got here for evenly selected pixels in the image, I'm showing you what a gray A oat near infrared spectra looks like, and there's, there's many of them. With stub oats, so these are oats that are a little bit shorter and fatter, but still still an oat, a larger oat, and then holes. Visually, based on those near infrared spectra, is there a difference? Can you see a difference? little bump up here and they finish off lower, yeah, good. Uh, so that particular wavelength range, 1,150, and then the 1,400 to 1,500 wavelength should be, what well, should be useful to discriminate between oats versus grows. Uh, now that's the primary objective here, right? So Emily has gone on, the, the reason why she looked at stub oats and large oats in her pieces is because Previous journal publications said that your near infrared spectra can get disturbed by the size of the particle you're imaging. So she imaged both large oats and stub oats. But I'm going to focus in this particular study purely on growths versus oats and, and holes, which are the outer shell of the oats. Okay. And as, as Matt pointed out, there is this region here and the region over there is, is, seems to show a difference. That's good. We, we want to see that, right? Okay, so here's the color image of the training data that Emily used. So she, she made sure she kept her samples pretty well um, stable, but she actually used near infrared imaging. But here's uh, a color image of the same sample that she used, provided obviously with near infrared. And there's the scores, T1, T2, T3, T4. So remember we showed last class how you can refold your scores back up into an image. There's the T1 image on the top left, T2, T3, T4. In the same order as before. Which of those scores seems to be most discriminating between classifying oats and growths? So here's, here's growths. This is the one without the shell, and then Oats are uh, holes over here, and oats over there. So, really, we're looking at telling growths from holes. Let's say uh, we so we want to take. We're assuming we've got a stream only of growths, and we want to see how many holes are in that stream. Can we pick up any holes in that stream? Because the, really, the holes are the thing that's downgrading us to a lower grade. Also, of course, the oats is going to downgrade us to a lower grade because it's it's nothing more than a growth with its hole one intact. So we don't want any holes in our grade in the stream. So how can we tell holes or oats from growths? 
Which of those scores seems to be most discriminating? T2. T2, yeah. So low T2 values, darker pixels, belong to the Grodes class, and higher T2 values belong to the Grodes class and, and Hells. T4 also shows some trend here. We're seeing darker pixels to lighter pixels, but there's a very sharp jump over here, and then there's a more gradual uh, change in T4. This is an unsupervised classifier, right? She's just done PCA on the image data. The image data, the image algorithm doesn't know of the, it doesn't know which pixels belong to which class. Okay, so this is an unsupervised PCA classifier. So when we were looking at the class last week, I didn't put it in that context to you, but when you generate the T1, T2, T3, T4, whichever plot combination you're generating in the score plot, you really are just showing the scores of the pixels and hoping to see discrimination. So like in the lumber image, we see the lumber being classified separately from the defense. For those of you that looked at the near infrared satellite image I put on the website, you can pick up the river from the, from the land. Okay, we see those clustering in the score plot. This is nothing more than an unsupervised classifier. Okay. So which cluster, without <laughs> any probably all looked ahead in the notes, but which cluster is the cluster from from the growths. One on the left, yeah, low T2 values. And so T2, we said from this previous image here, low T2 values corresponds to growths, high T2 values are lighter grayscale pixels, higher grayscale pixels belong to holes. Okay. So the T2 uh, score map over here, 0 to 255. On the y-axis, we've got Emily's used T4. So she's chosen the two scores that happen to show most separation. It's zero up here and 255 down there on the T4 axis. Okay. So if she's chosen T2 to discriminate these, this grouping over here, one thing to always look at is your loadings to understand what's going on here. And so I've asked you, does the layout of the score plot make sense? Probably better to ask, does, do the loadings match with what we see in the scores? Okay. Jake's like, yes, why? Well, the T2, low T2 corresponds to the growth, and then, so the first quarter of that P2 graph, and then negative. Negative P2 times negative, uh, negative, negative, sorry, you want, you want a negative T. Right, so. Yeah. Um, an X that's high in growth and then P2 is negative T. Right. And this, this is higher up here. If you go correspond, uh, look at the corresponding regions for this plot, it's higher than it is on average for the other plots of the image. And then similarly at the end, which I guess it's, it's more clear, this, especially with the, with the tail end of P2. So there's positive coefficients in P2, so that's positive times a negative, these are lower values, gets you a negative T2. So the loadings absolutely do make sense. Okay. So what you, what you can go do then is you can go uh, build your mask over that region and map back all those pixels back to the original image. You see that it's showing that there's a few growths uh, inside this region that is oats. Now oats are growths with their shell on. Okay? And it's no surprise that you see a few growths show up here because there could be a growth lined up with the shell slightly exposed, the hole slightly open. And those are the locations of growths. Okay? So it's very, very sensitive. It's, a, it's amazingly sensitive, right? Uh, picking up those growths in amongst a sample of oats. If you look back here, we're getting some misclassification the other way around. Okay. Probably more, more, more than we would be comfortable with. It's basically telling us these pixels are, are holes. But it doesn't make sense. If we look at the geometry of this, of the pixels that have not been marked as white, they're not holes. If we go back to our original image and look at it carefully, those aren't holes over there. So this PCA model by and of itself, this unsupervised classifier, is, is misclassifying for us in that image space. It, one thing we don't see are any pixels here in the whole plot, which is expected. 
we shouldn't see any pixels from this region, which should be just roads, just the inner part. We shouldn't see any of them there, and we don't. But we do get some of this classification the other way around. Or put it this way, we're not picking up sufficient, uh, we're not correctly classifying all the pixels in this class. So probably have too low a sensitivity to use online. What she did go do is do a PLSDA. Now this is interesting because PLSDA means we've got a Y variable corresponding to every X observation. And every X observation is a pixel. Okay. So normally we don't do regression with image data. We can't regress our image onto a Y variable because we don't know the Y value for every pixel in our image. But in Emily's case, she, she kind of does. She knows that if she's got an image purely of growths, every image pixel in that, in that image should be a growth. And if she's simply taking images only of the holes, then every pixel, the Y value corresponds to every pixel in that image should be from the hole. So she built a model for growths versus oats, or in other words, uh, growths with uh, oats is nothing more than a growth with a shell on. She's labeled that as zero, and that is one. And did the corresponding the infrared spectra, the raw data, the gray aos, and like I said in the PLSDA section, it's really important to go and look at the coefficient plot to see which is the most discriminating features. In this case, my features are wavelengths. So which are the most important wavelengths that tell me the difference between oats versus growths? In fact, it highlights it much more cleanly. It highlights that little blip that you picked up there earlier, which wasn't apparent in the unsupervised PCA. If you look back at those loadings for P2, we don't really, um, let's see, just over 1,100. Oh, okay, I guess we're seeing it in its absence. We pick it up as nothing over there. Right? So it doesn't really pick it up in P2. Uh, but in the coefficient plot, we're really seeing that as, a, as the most important part of the wavelength range to separate. Okay. And we're also seeing a grouping up here at 1,500 corresponding to the dimension there. This is really powerful, right? Because a near-infrared camera that measures the entire spectrum is going to be super expensive. But if you can get a single channel near-infrared camera that only images at that wavelength and maybe one wavelength in that region, you should likely be able to tell them apart still. Okay? That's easy for Emily to try out. She can go back to her original data and say, what if I only had an image at that particular wavelength and at that particular wavelength, could I still tell them apart reliably with the low degree of misclassification? Rather than purchasing an expensive camera that images the entire spectrum, for which arguably I don't use all of it, I do use some of it, and other regions I use a lot more than others, can I buy a near infrared device that's sensitive to those wavelengths over there? So you can use that to improve your knowledge. Then you can predict your Y hat. So she's taken the raw data X minus your coefficient, uh, I'm sorry, times your coefficient. So X times B is going to get your Y hat. So she's Use PLS in its regression form to get a prediction for Y. And her Y hat is then what's shown here on the, on the X axis. And on the Y axis, it's just a histogram of the number of pixels you get corresponding to this zero prediction and the one prediction. And she found a threshold that gives maximum separation at roughly 0.53. So that was a good threshold that gives minimum this classification. Anyone notice the, the error there? There is an error in, in her thesis. I asked her about it this morning. She confirmed by email. Do, the, do those loadings, uh, do those coefficients make sense? No. Because yeah. they're flipped in sign. Something, something went wrong in her calculation. You're saying a positive coefficient times a negative for growth, you should get a 
positive times a negative, your growth should be your zero class, and your oats should be your one class. So um, you can please correct. I intentionally left it in the notes like this. That should be growth. That should be oats. Her, her growth predictions are ne negative predictions, low negative y's, and her oats predictions are positive predictions. So it should be plus one. It's just flipped around. So uh, maybe just in, in, I, I can't stress this enough. For a PLSDA model, you, should, you must always go investigate that coefficient plot uh, from the PLSDA. Finally, uh, this is of course on the test, on the training day, you, you go ahead and test it. And here she's showing two images of new testing data for oats and for growths. Your prediction image, she's shown this in an interesting way. She's shown the y hat in its raw form before you round it down to a zero or a one. So you're seeing some trends over there. And then she goes and thresholds it. So she says, if my y hat is greater than 0.53, I'm going to set that pixel to a 1, or if it's less than that, I'm going to set it to a 0. So this is called binary or thresholded image, thresholded against that, uh, that 0.53 value. And so you just look, this picks up the misclassifications for you. Very interesting when she went to go look at those misclassif misclassifications up here, they were actually um, what she, she thought when she looked at this oats, she had pulled out all the holes. Right? She actually found that the camera picked up some holes that she had missed that were just peeking through. So the, the camera actually picked up what she thought was a pure growth sample that she had manually gone and cleaned, actually found some holes. Uh, and the other way around. So uh, right now, when you, the trained operators do this in the process, and they can easily make a mistake of just one putting one oat inside the wrong category, you can downgrade that batch. Uh, so this is showing a lot of promise for, for online use. Uh, here's, a, here's another uh, prediction image on new data. So I'll just end here and say that I, I strongly recommend you go and just read it, the thesis, that chapter. It's just one chapter, four from the thesis. It's, it's a good. Uh, She's written it very well, very easy to read. Unsupervised classification gets you a good way ahead, but I've, I've always found that supervised classification gets you a lot further and, and separates those classes out more strongly. Um, and in this case, any misclassification was due to error in the raw data, not, not due to the model. So, just a few minutes left over to you, but uh, any questions on that? Another been a long day for you all.